we're in Second Corinthians, starting a brand new chapter. There's only 13 chapters. We are now starting chapter 12. So, uh, chapter 11, of course, we'll see um, what we the end of it in our review, and then we'll go into chapter 12. And I always remind people that when Paul wrote these, they were just long, like this would have been a long, long letter. Uh, but there were no chapter divisions, no verses. It was just a letter, like you would write, only this one was inspired by God and it held the doctrine uh, that would teach the church of all ages. Uh, the will of God. So it's a little different than a letter. But So when I say we're ending chapter 11 in our review at verse 33 and beginning chapter 12 at verse 1, um, Paul just continued to write when he was writing it. I'm, I thank God, as I've said many, many times, for the translators who put in chapters and verses to help us find a way around much easier. But always remember the chapters and the verses aren't inspired, the words are. Um, chapters and verses were added by men, so they might not have always divided the verses where it would have helped us the most, or might not have separated the chapters where it would have helped us the most. But at any rate, it's what we got, and man, is it good. So let's look at review here. Second Corinthians 11, verses 29 to 31. And when I'm doing review anymore, this is kind of a new thing I've started recently. A lot of times I'll put a modern translation under the King James, like you'll see uh, in when we get to our lesson, the, the first verse I read is the King James verse, and then I'll usually have a modern translation under it. And the letters tell us what translation that is. Now, in review to save time and make it maybe a little more understandable, in most cases, I'd skip the King James and just put the verse I had underneath it from a modern translation in the review. So, in 2 Corinthians 11.29, I have the translation for that verse from the New Living Translation. And here's what Paul wrote. Who is weak without, without my feeling that weakness? Who is led astray and I do not burn with anger? So he was talking about false prophets false apostles really is a better term for the particular people he is referring to here uh, and uh, who were bringing in false doctrine and trying to cut the ties of the believers in Corinth from Paul so they could have them all to themselves and um, so Paul had uh, bragged before verse 29 and the lesson before that about all the things he suffered physical suffering and uh, then he said at the end of the, ver the, the lesson before the review lesson, uh, he said, and besides all those physical sufferings, I have the care of all the churches. So I have the weight of all the churches on my shoulders. And so now he explains that in verse 29. He's saying, in essence, among all those believers in all those churches, who is weak without my feeling that weakness? And who is led astray, and I do not burn with anger. So, uh, he seen those believers and those churches as his spiritual children, and uh, he did not like it when people were leading them astray. Verse 30 in the Good News Bible, he said, If I must boast, I will boast about things that show how weak I am. Usually braggarts brag about things that they think make them stand out and look great. Brag about how much money they have. Brag about uh, how much stuff they have. Brag about how great a job they have. Brag about uh, all kinds of things that they want you to feel inferior to them in those areas. That's what braggers do. They want to elevate themselves. And the best way to elevate themselves isn't to go up higher. It's to bring you and I lower. So they don't uh, say things that will lift us up higher. Uh, but rather they say things to lift themselves up uh, higher in the sense that we feel bad that we don't have the new car and the great job and so forth. So that's not what Paul did. He said, if you're going to force me to brag, I'll brag. 
the title last week's lesson was you brag about what you want to brag about I'll brag about what I want to brag about so he bragged about being shipwrecked he bragged about being beaten 39 with 39 stripes uh, five different times or three different times he, uh, by the Jews he bragged about being beaten with rods five times by the Romans uh, he bragged about shipwrecked three times he bragged about sometimes not having warm enough clothes for where he was at in the journey uh, he he uh, bra- things that you think you, how do you brag about that he was bragging about it because he said I'll brag about things that let me know how weak I am because when I am weak he's strong he'll, he'll get into that not in today's lesson but next Sunday's lesson alright so Verse 31, The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forevermore, know that I lie not. We just talked about Paul. Uh, that wasn't new to Paul. Uh, he would uh, bring in God into his... Um, when he was defending himself uh, against false teachers uh, who were trying to lead people astray, he would bring in God in a conversation, God knows that I don't lie. And I brought out last week... You know, you hear some of that today. There will be people that tell you things and then they'll use this expression. Swear to God. The difference is, in my observation, most people who say swear to God are lying through their teeth. They're just trying to get something from you. And they know you don't believe what they're saying. So they'll end it with swear to God. And we brought out last week that if you say swear to God... To Paul, if he brought God into the equation, he had to be perfectly honest. He would not denigrate God's holiness by saying, God knows that I don't lie when he is lying. Where it's a natural thing today for many liars to say, swear to God. And uh, that's taking the name of the Lord thy God in vain. That's breaking the third commandment, invoking God in your argument, when it doesn't mean a thing to you, but you hope it persuades somebody to believe you. All right. Uh, Verses 32 in the Good News Bible and 33 in the New Living Translation, Paul said, When I was in Damascus, the governor under King Aretas placed guards at the city gates to arrest me. But I was lowered in a basket through a window in the city wall, and that's how I got away. So Paul returned to boasting about how weak he was. Um... He, in essence, is almost saying tongue-in-cheek, I'm so weak and pathetic that uh, they had to put me in a basket to help me escape. So he continued to brag about the things that made him his weakness apparent. And uh, what didn't he brag about? What doesn't Paul brag about? He doesn't brag how the Jerusalem apostles took Paul's side and defended his gospel in Acts 15. He had the weight of all the apostles. Not just was he an apostle... He had the weight of all the apostles behind him. He doesn't brag about the miracles God did through him. Just read the book of Acts. Uh, He doesn't brag about all the churches he started. Things that a lot of people would brag about if they were walking in Paul's sandals. He didn't brag about. Rather, he boasted about the things that let others see how weak he is. Amazing thing. Hard for us to wrap our brain around that and call it bragging. Uh, all right, now, starting the next chapter. The lesson today is entitled, What an Amazing Trip That Was. Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 1 to 5 is where we're going to be today. And so, um, there'll be other translations under it, uh, but the original verse will always be in the King James now. So in verse 1, It is not expedient for me doubtless to glory... I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. Uh, The New Living Translation makes it a little more understandable for us. This boasting is also foolish, but let me go on. Let me tell about visions and revelations I received from the Lord. Now, again, you've heard me say many times, if you want to know the meaning of a word and you're proficient on the Internet, you go to dictionary.com. If you don't look up the meaning of words that way, you will pick up an old Webster's Dictionary. How many of you still have a Webster's Dictionary? Just the three of you. I I can find one on Google, but I don't have one in my house, a Webster's Dictionary. Uh, But 
We go to Webster's, probably the most famous of all dictionaries that we've had in this country. So there's an, a word we don't know the meaning of in English. We go to Webster's Dictionary. Remember, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, the language of the Jews. The New Testament was written in Greek, not Hebrew, uh, because it was to all people, not just Jews. And um, when Alexander the Great conquered the whole then known world, he mandated that everybody had to learn a simple form of Greek so his soldiers could communicate with them. And so when Rome overthrew the, Gre- uh, the Grecian Empire, they didn't redo the will. They already had a way to communicate, and that was Greek. So when the New Testament was written in Greek, it, it made it so that everybody who could read, probably not a lot of readers in those days, uh, but all those who could read could read the New Testament because it was written in Greek. All right? So if you want to know what a New Testament word means, you go to Thayer's Greek Dictionary, who tells us what the Greek word that was rendered vision, what the Greek word that was rendered revelation, what it means. So, I got a couple of Thayer's um, definitions. The word vision means uh, a sight, a vision, an appearance presented to one rather asleep or awake. Uh, revelation means laying bare, making naked. Uh, in other words, it's a disclosure of truth, instruction, helping to make things, in other words, more understandable to you. Concerning things before unknown, like the gospel was a um, mystery for a long time, but when they be- because there was no gospel in the Old Testament, but after Jesus died and rose again, uh, there now this wonderful message called the gospel, and it was hidden in the past, but now it's been revealed. It's a revelation. All right, so uh, it's used of events by which things or states or persons hitherto withdrawn from view or made visible to all. So Paul's saying, now I'm going to start for a moment bragging about visions and revelation. Now that's a more normal kind of thing to brag about. We understand that, right? Because so far he's just been bragging about things that make him appear weak. So now he said, okay, you like braggers. You seem to put up with all the bragging those false apostles do. I'm going to turn my bragging now to visions and revelations. All right? So, Paul continues to brag, but he now changes the subject of what he's going to brag about. He is not going to brag about things that others would want to brag about if they had his experiences. He's about to brag about the amazing revelations God has given him and the man of God is you. So verse 2, verse 2 and verse 3, uh, verse 3 is just a reiteration of part of verse 2. But here's verse 2. I knew a man in Christ about 14 years ago, above 14 years ago. Rather in the body I cannot tell, or rather out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth. Such in one caught up to the third heaven. Good News Bible says, I know a certain Christian man who 14 years ago was snatched up to the highest heaven. I do not know whether this actually happened or whether he had a vision. Only God knows. The translation called God's Word. I know a follower of Christ who was snatched away to the third heaven 14 years ago. I don't know whether this happened to him physically or spiritually. Only God knows. It's interesting to see how different translations render that. And uh, then flipping it over... Uh, he reiterates part of that uh, in verse 3. And I, I, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell. God knoweth. So Paul reemphasizes that he didn't know if God actually took him to heaven bodily, picked him up and took him, or if he had witnessed this amazing event in a vision. Now, what do we learn from these two verses? Regardless of the fact that Paul might never have left earth bodily, might he didn't even know whether he had ever actually physically left earth or whether he had a vision about heaven he is showing us through his words that the experience was so real that he could have very well been in heaven physically he had no idea but I, I love how he, he closes those, both of those verses 2 and 3 he said God knows Sometimes God does amazing things and we can't explain it, but God knows. Amen? So that's all that really matters. Now, we're going to get into 
this amazing trip that he took. Verse 4, how that he, by the way, Paul is talking in the third person. He's talking about himself in the third person as though he's outside of himself, saying, I know a man. Well, you ought to know him. He's lived, uh, walked in his sandals his entire life. He's talking about himself, and um, there is no dispute among that among Bible scholars. He is not addressing somebody he knew. He is addressing himself in the most humble way that he can think to address himself. Not even mentioning, not using the word I. I was caught up to the third heaven. He said, I knew a man about 14 years ago. And he later said, I'm going to boast about that man. But here in verse 4, he said, he, or Paul in other words, was caught up in the paradise. There's that word, John. John's always wondering about paradise. He was caught up in the paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. So, that last part, after paradise, we'll get into paradise here in a minute, but heard unspeakable words not lawful for a man to utter. I've got seven other translations where I'm just sharing that part of the verse, all right? So regarding those things, the Good News Bible said, He heard things which cannot be put into words. Things that human lips may not speak. Bible in basic English. Words came to his ears which may not be said, and which man is not able to say. Temporary English version. He heard things that are too wonderful to tell. Easy to read version. He heard things that he is not able to explain. He heard things that no one is allowed to tell. God's Word. He heard things that can't be expressed in words. Think that hum- things that humans cannot put into words. The Amplified Version. Utterances beyond the power of man to put into words, which man is not permitted to utter. And in Young's literal translation, he heard unutterable sayings that it is not possible for man to speak. So you can see the translators are all having a difficult time figuring out exactly what Paul's saying here. Is Paul, Paul is definitely saying one of two things. He's saying, I heard stuff that God told me to keep my mouth shut and don't tell anybody. It's unlawful for me to say. Because God said not to. Or he's saying, I heard stuff which I couldn't, I, I, human language doesn't have the words to explain it. There's no way I could tell you if I wanted to. That's one of the... Those are the underlying thing. He said, I heard stuff. The amazing thing is, he said he heard unspeakable words. How do you hear unspeakable words? It reminded me of Romans 8, 26. How that uh, the Holy Spirit lives in us and we don't know how to pray, so... He intercedes for us which, with groanings that cannot be uttered. Now, that's not tongues. Tongues, you can get a lot of teaching on that in First Corinthians 14. You say, why do you say it's not tongues? Because Acts chapter, chapter 2 says, And they spoke with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Over here in Romans 8.26, there were groanings that cannot be uttered. So it's not tongues, because tongues is an utterance. But it is the Holy Spirit speaking through you either in tongues or in groanings here in Romans 8.26. But I found it fascinating. The Holy Spirit prays because I don't know how to pray for my journey, how to get where God wants to get me. Which is, uh, God, uh, what's God up to in my life? The Bible tells me in Romans 8, conforming me to the image of His Son. That's what God is up to in my life. I don't know how to get there. Don't know how to pray as I ought. So the Holy Spirit intercedes for me with groanings that cannot be uttered. In other words, unspeakable groanings. It reminds me, Paul said, I heard unspeakable words. How in the world did he know what was being said? Well, obviously, 
he's having a visit uh, with God in an amazing trip. And so God's communicating to him. And so consequently, uh, whatever God's saying, whether it can be uttered or not, whether it can be understood or not, Paul was getting revelation from this. But it was so amazing. My mind just exploded in a thousand different directions when I'm studying this. It's so amazing. You know I got some ideas about heaven that a lot of people don't talk about. You and I live in a three-dimensional world. God stands outside that three-dimensional world because He created it. So God is more than three dimensions. How much more? I don't know. But one thing, if you're in the outside looking in and you create this thing outside of you, then you're more than the three dimensions. Now, in other words, God's reality is a lot bigger than our reality. We just think the New Jerusalem is going to come down, we're going to have houses and cars and all kinds of little things running around, and and it's just going to be an extended life like this one. Outside of New Jerusalem, probably so, because there's going to be people being born on an ongoing basis outside the city. But inside the city, you and I are going to live with the Lord. It's going to be 1,400 miles long, 1,400 miles high, and 14, I mean wide, and 1,400 miles high. I insist that can't be done in a three-dimensional realm. Nothing but outer space up there. But God doesn't live the way we do. If Paul either went to heaven in vision or in reality, he was seeing stuff that there are no human words to explain. Now you say, what about John's revelation when he saw into heaven? God showed him everything in pictures. It was a very different thing with John the Revelator. That's why what we think is the uh, Chinese army he sees as locust. God showing a first century man something that he can identify with. No, not not the the army. That's something else. This um, this thing flying through the air with the face of a man and so forth, a helicopter that uh, that are called locust. Um, Today we think they're helicopters, and um, but how does a man in the first century understand a helicopter? So God showed him the whole revelation in pictures, pictures that he could identify with, write down that God knew when we were getting close we could figure out what those things really were, because that technology is here now. That's not what Paul was doing. Paul didn't see a vision of heaven that he was going to explain to us. He seen something that he couldn't explain. There are books written by people who died and went to heaven. They're telling you everything. They're telling you about beautiful flower gardens. They're telling. Isn't it amazing? Paul said, "I can't tell you." The most in- in- incredible experience of his lifetime, and he doesn't write a book. He wrote a lot of books. They're in the New Testament. He doesn't write one about that. Now I trust Paul a little more than I trust all these other people that are dying and going to heaven. Sorry. I just do. And so, how come they're so free to tell everybody everything? And I tell you what, they tell me doesn't sound much different than Beverly Hills or something. How many of you know there are beautiful flower gardens everywhere? Heaven is going to be beyond. Eye is not seen. Ear is not heard. It's going to be beyond anything you can imagine anything. Paul is seeing and hearing and his mind is being blown. Now I've known people like Jason and Amber, snooty people who had the money to go to Hawaii. Paradise. Took a trip to paradise. This verse has the word paradise in it. He always tells me, you guys got to go to Hawaii sometime. I say, is there an amusement park there? Why would I spend all that money to look at an ocean? The ocean's going to look the same tomorrow that it did today. How about a flyover? How about if I just do a flyover in a helicopter or something? Uh, but to them it was a paradise. They loved it and they want to go back someday. And they talk about how great a trip it was. Paul had a trip. 
You know when you try to sell something, Jason tried to sell why, you even make up stories when you can't get it sold any other way. <laughs> he, tell, he tried to tell me that the pineapple in Hawaii is better than the pineapple at high bees. Um, and I just don't buy it. That's some of my favorite food in the, on the planet, that pineapple at high bees. Uh, so anyway, he's trying to sell me a bag of goods. Uh, but he went to paradise and talks about it all the time with, if, if the subject comes up. Paul made a trip to the most incredible place, the real paradise, and talked about it for a couple verses one time. Is that amazing or what? Theme things that blew his mind. The commentators can't agree what all this means. They're all guessing. The translators can't agree what it all means. They're guessing. Paul heard unspeakable words. How do you understand words that can't be spoken? He knew they were words. They weren't groanings like the Holy Spirit in Romans 8.26. They were words. But he said they're unspeakable. Does that mean he was hearing telepathic words? That mean up in heaven when we're not going to have talk, we we're going to have telepathy. I don't know. It, uh, Paul didn't know. <laughs> if Paul was there and didn't know, and I haven't been there, chances are I don't know. Make sense to you? So, by the way, paradise is mentioned in two other verses in Scripture, um, besides, well, never in the Old Testament, three times in the New Testament when he said he was caught up to paradise. In Luke twenty three forty three, Jesus said to the thief on the cross, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Um, in Revelation 2, 7, he said, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life with, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And then in uh, our today's lesson, he was caught up into paradise. So, what exactly is paradise? In Luke, it appears to refer to the place where Old Testament saints and New Testament saints prior to the resurrection of Jesus Christ went to await the resurrection so that they could be allowed into heaven. The thief on the cross did not go to heaven that day. Nobody went to heaven till Jesus resurrected. Matthew 27 is pretty abundantly clear about that. The Old Testament saints did not resurrect till after Jesus resurrected. So, the three days after he died, nobody was in heaven yet. Nobody had ever went to heaven. Nobody went into heaven those three days. So when he tells the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise, he's talking about a place that he's going to put him, that he's going to himself. Jesus is going to paradise to preach the gospel to the Old Testament saints and New Testament saints that are dying before they uh, might get saved during the lifetime, are not saved as we understand, they put their faith in the Jesus as being the Son of God, uh, and then die before Jesus dies and resurrects. Uh, so it appears to have something to do with what one uh, area of Scripture called Abraham's bosom. All right? Now in, in the Revelation, he said, I'll... He that overcometh, I'll give to eat of the tree of life which is in the midst of the paradise of God. There's a paradise refers in some fashion to the Garden of Eden. That's where the tree of life was. Why can't they find it? The book of Genesis tells us all the rivers around there. I think it's one of two things. It's either in heaven right now, that place called paradise, or it's always where it was, but it's in a different dimension, and we just simply can't see it. God came and went in there, and it gives you the idea. Now, God can come and go anywhere He wants. Um, but it just gives you the idea that there was something odd about that. So, um, now the paradise in our verse seems to be up, uh, talking about heaven. So, John's always saying, is paradise the same as heaven? Well, in this verse, it seems to be. The other two verses, it doesn't. So it's probably that the word paradise simply means a very nice place. Would you call Hawaii a paradise? Uh, not the Garden of Eden, it's not heaven. 
But uh, you see ads all the time about going to some island somewhere. It's paradise. Uh, so, at any rate, paradise would definitely refer to heaven in that regard because heaven's as good as it gets. So, what makes... The amazing trip uh, that was. Why did Paul, down here toward the bottom, write that it was not lawful for a man to utter the unspeakable words he heard? This is a commentator called Benson. He wrote, It was to encourage him in the difficult and dangerous works in which he was engaged. Accordingly, by taking him up into paradise and showing him the glories of the invisible world and making him a witness of the happiness which the righteous enjoy with Christ even before the resurrection... His faith in the promises of the gospel must have been so exceedingly strengthened and his hope so raised as to enable him to bear with alacrity the heavy load of complicated evils to which he was exposed in the course of his ministry. So Benson, they've all got different ideas. Benson says God took him up there to encourage him because he was suffering so much. Now remember, if you want to see what something's talking about, see what it's talking about. What's the context right now of Paul's writing? Chapter 11. I was beaten. I was shipwrecked. I was robbed. Um, beaten again. Uh, hanging on a board in the middle of a sea for a day and a night. And uh, uh, doesn't tell us how he got off that board. If he got washed ashore, doesn't tell us. But uh, went through one thing after another. Many times he had no food to eat. Sometimes he fasted on purpose. So he didn't eat, but other times there was nothing to eat. Boy, how do the faith preachers work all that into this? Uh, did Paul not have faith? But at any rate, the point I'm getting at is that Paul went to heaven and he's telling his story in the context of boasting about things that show his weakness. Now, next week, we're going to get in, notice verse 5 down here, uh, of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I'll not glory, but in my infirmities. He said, I'll break about that man I'm talking about, who is me. But really, I'm only going to break about my weaknesses. Now, in verses 8 and 9, you'll see in an answer up here, Why did Paul write it was not lawful? All right, now an answer after Benson's commentary. In verses 8 and 9 of this same chapter, we'll get into it next week, Paul mentioned that the weight of his persecutions was so severe that he sought God three times to deliver him from these things. He called them by way of thorn in the flesh. He said, because of my abundant revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. All right? And as you go down from that thought, that would have been in verses 6 and 7. As you go down from that thought, in verses 8 and 9, he said, I thought God three times to deliver me from this constant suffering. And God told him, My grace is sufficient for thee. Perhaps this truth was revealed to him in paradise by hearing words spoken to him that he didn't understand because he didn't know the language, but he did understand because he felt the meaning. And is that what happened? As Paul said earlier, God knows. In other words, perhaps the very reason God gets them, you know, when, when Paul said, I sought the Lord three times, maybe that was in paradise. I don't know. God knows. Maybe when God zapped him up physically or in a vision, vision to heaven, maybe that's when he was saying, he's got a face-to-face -face audience with God. How would that be? And uh, he said, Lord, this thorn in the flesh, this demon of Satan that follows me around everywhere and stirs up trouble so I'm getting beaten all the time and facing death every moment in every city. Would you remove that from me? And you know, God doesn't always answer right away. He said, how do you know that? Because there's a story about God not answering right away. They brought to Jesus a woman taken in adultery. Said Moses' law says, Stoner, what do you say? He just gets down and draws pictures or writes words. We don't know. 
God knows. I love Paul's answer. Uh, I'm going to use that sometimes on a Bible discussion night. Someone asks me a question that I uh, don't have a good answer for. God knows. Um, just take all the pressure out. Uh, what did Jesus write on the ground? Millions of guesses. I've guessed a few times myself. The truth is, God knows. I don't know what Jesus wrote on the ground. God knows. Jesus was in no hurry to answer the question. So maybe up there in heaven, if that's where, because it's all in the context. It's all one journey through these uh, several verses here. He's talking about going to heaven, talking about a thorn in the flesh, now talking about God telling him my grace is sufficient. Maybe all this happened in paradise. Don't know. God knows. And maybe up there in heaven he asked God, would you, would you remove this thorn in my flesh? I can't bear it much longer. And evidently God didn't answer it, whether he prayed it here on earth or asked him up in heaven. So he asked him again. How many of you ever asked for the same thing more than once? And evidently God didn't answer because He said, I asked Him three times. And finally after the third time, He gave Paul revelation that should help us all. My grace is sufficient. God never promised to take any of us out of the troubles we're facing. Ever. Never promised to wipe away my, the tears of my eyes until I get to heaven. That's in Revelation chapter 21, folks. I'm going to do some crying between now and then. So are you. Jesus says, as long as you're in this world, you'll have trouble. Paul had an amazing vacation. I'm not sure. I think it might have trumped theirs. God knows. Ah, uh, But at any rate, what an amazing trip. I think I'm going to go to bed tonight and say, Lord, I... show me where you took Paul. I thought of that when I, I didn't pick that song this morning uh, for this lesson. But when I sang that part, take me to that holy place. Tell all I see is you. Boy, that'd be a journey, wouldn't it? That'd be a journey. So, verse 5 again. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself I'll not glory, but in my infirmities. Again, so he's saying, I would boast about that guy who happened to be him in the third person. I would boast about that guy, yet I'll only boast about my infirmity. So how do you tie those two things together? He said, I'll boast about that guy that went to heaven, but I'll only boast about my infirmities. It makes me think that's where that conversation took place. It makes me think. That's when he asked God three times, and God said, my grace is sufficient. It makes me think that. God only knows. 